Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com slash timaneke. The Dog Driver Show is brought to you by Dr. Tim's Pet Food, makers of such foods as Momentum, Fusion, Glacier, and Pursuit Athletic Dog Foods. Dr. Tim's has fed five of the last eight Iditarod winners and some of the fastest sprint dogs on the planet. Dr. Tim's, a food for success. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. From First Paw Media, sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company, this is the Dog Driver Show. Visit our website at dogworksradio.com. Now here are your hosts, Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert for the Dog Driver Show and I am joined by my co-host KP. It is a beautiful spring day here in Alaska and we are joined by another Alaskan musher. It's always good to have the hometown guys and gals on. Who are we talking to today, KP? Uh, we're going to be talking to a very good friend of ours, uh, Pam Schomburg, and she's a physician who lives in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, right in town, and uh, extremely competitive four-dog racer, and uh, she's been introduced to, uh, I believe, uh, sled dog racing in, in uh, 2003, and she's been racing very, very competitively uh, in the four-dog class for the last few years that I remember. Uh, she has a she's a mom. She has kids, and she has a full time job, and she is uh, putting a lot, lot, lot uh, behind uh, this dog team that she's racing. Pam, how are you doing? Good. Good morning. Good morning to you. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got uh, the uh, sled dog bug, and uh, how uh, uh, important is sled dog racing uh, in your life. Well, I uh, grew up in Wisconsin, so I grew up skiing, and I moved up to Alaska in 1999, and I brought my kind of mixed breed uh, rescue mutt with me, and uh, when I came up, I was introduced to ski joring, and uh, the logical progression of that is you start ski joring your one dog, you fall in love with it, your dog loves it, so you think, gosh, one dog is great, two dogs will be even better, and sure enough, it is, and then you're like, wow, two dogs is great what about a sled? And then you start moving into sled classes. That's what uh, got me into uh, running sled. And so now we found ourselves with uh, 13 dogs. Uh, tell us a little bit about your dogs. Uh, you have 13 dogs and uh, you select some of them, I believe, uh, for your uh, schedule classes and some of them for your uh, four dog class. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, they're all pretty interchangeable on either scheduling or sled class. Um, right now, we have four that are in full retirement, so we only have nine that are running. Actually, two are pups that haven't seen harnesses yet, so uh, they'll be learning soon. But we try to train all the dogs to be able to do all the disciplines, um, so they'll all do uh, dry land and scheduling and uh, dog sledding. Uh, but yeah, we have a wide range of dogs that we've um, got from numerous different uh, kennels and mushers and uh, it has worked out well for us so far. What do you look for when you are selecting a dog as an adult dog or as a puppy? So um, I've, when I first got into the sport, I, all my dogs came in as adults Um, I now have been um, selecting more puppies coming in just because it's easier to introduce them to an existing kennel of adult dogs, and it just seems to be an easier transition uh, coming in. 
But when I first started acquiring our own kennel, actually, I'll back up. When I started skidgering in Anchorage, uh, a woman named Kirsten Ballard loaned me her dog uh, because she was kind of retiring from the sport. So I started training with him, and he was probably 95 pounds of fit, lean, leggy muscle. And um, he was always up to something on the trail, and usually – it wasn't necessarily good, but when we were moving, he was the fastest dog I'd ever seen and the most powerful. So being that I kind of was brought into the sport with that being the first serious dog I ran, I, I really developed a love for this kind of big, leggy male dogs. Um, so that's kind of what I started looking for when I got into the sport. It's still kind of what I look for to this day. Um, I uh, just noticed something you mentioned. I never noticed. Uh, all all your dogs are males. We have one female dog. Oh, okay. uh, that is my uh, daughter's dog. She got as a Christmas present two years ago. Um, but yeah, short of that, every other one of our dogs is male. I know that you have a kind of a miniature, uh, uh, not a farm, but uh, you have a little bit more property in Anchorage that some of the other people do. And uh, how you organize all the dogs, and I believe you have horses and chickens and other <laughs> critters in the yard. How do you organize all of that? It, you know, it's an ongoing process. We're always trying to kind of tinker with it and improve on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we do have two horses. And so getting the horses set up was kind of the biggest first thing that we did. But with the dogs, it's it's been a challenge since we are right in Anchorage. Um, and many other kennels have had issues with noise concerns with neighbors. So when we moved in, we kind of were trying to be as preventative as possible. And to this day, we have not had any noise complaints, which is great. But we do not have an outside dog yard because of that Um, we have a big fenced yard so the dogs spend multiple hours a day running around the fenced yard but they're supervised and we try to keep barking and howling to a minimum and then we have an indoor kennel system um, which definitely helps dampen the noise and being that's right below my bedroom if they're barking in the middle of the night we're aware (laughs) and uh, we can go uh, you know ask them to stop and uh, that's kind of been one of the biggest challenges of trying to balance uh, outdoor time and exercise time outdoors, but yet um, trying to meet uh, city noise level requirements. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Pam is uh, very competitive in the four dog four dog class and very dedicated uh, in the training part of it. Also, as a matter of fact, uh, very often uh, when I'm training uh, my team, I see her. Uh, uh, training, you know, her uh, uh, dogs and two or three or four dog teams running uh, with uh, her machine. How important is, Pam, to have a very precise and scheduled training system to be competitive? Um, it, being that I grew up skiing and running and early on doing triathlons myself, I kind of have pulled from a little bit of that um, experience that training is key to everything. Um, I probably do a couple things differently than a lot of people do, even though say this year I was training up, uh, seven dogs. I didn't run all seven at once and then be done. Um, I knew that the seven were of different levels and different speeds and different capabilities. So Kuroshi, yeah, you, you probably saw me out there running, um, a team of two and then a team of three and then, you know, running these little tiny micro teams together um, because I was really pairing up dogs um, uh, to be able to run with a dog that has equal speed and capability with them. Um, My daughter is mushing. So her dogs that are also being trained up are not as fast and as powerful. So they were often being trained separately and often I'll train with other mushers who have dogs that we know, okay, this is kind of the older, slower team, or this is the medium speed team, and we'll pool teams together so we have, you know, five or six dogs rather than a three-dog team on a training run. So how do you schedule, being a mom, of course, uh, with two kids, uh, having a job, having a uh, competitive dog team, how do you juggle with all of that? It, it's a constant, ongoing um, 
work in progress. Uh, it's uh, it, sometimes uh, we don't get the training in that we want to get in during a week uh, because we had too many after school commitments. Our my job um, required a lot of hours that week, uh, but it's you know the good thing is we can kind of be flexible. There's been times where. Uh, the kids were in school. I didn't have time to drive up to where I can train with a four wheeler. Um, so I would train locally on a scooter and take dogs out just one or two at a time on scooter runs. Um, on the weekends, my kids have been a huge help now that they're older and they will actually come along and help me train. My son is all about getting four wheeler up and going and my daughter is all about getting the dogs harnessed and ready. And so they, they're a huge help when they're available. But, yeah, during the week, it's always kind of a juggle. And sometimes, you know, in the winter, we're out running with headlamps on um, late at night. And my daughter's running whip sled with me. So, you know, we we just kind of do the best we can. Usually, as Alaskans, uh, Robert, uh, sprinters, uh, since we have the mecca of our sport here uh, with beautiful trails and conditions, a lot of us, we don't travel because we have beautiful trails right next door. Uh, Pam did something very interesting this year. She took uh, her dogs and she actually went down south and uh, saw some of those trails. Uh, Pam, tell us a little bit about what you experienced down there. Yeah, so um, I have to say Deb Summers went with me and uh, I wouldn't have gone without her. So that was key to my travel. Uh, we, between the two of us, we took, I believe it was nine dogs going down. Uh, five of mine and four of hers, and we did it during the dryland season and went and competed um, uh, dryland down in Wisconsin and up in Quebec. Um, I, I was a little hesitant to try that during the winter season because we did tow a camper, and we were able to stay in the camper, and that made um, travel really nice. Um, I'm not sure how that would work in the winter, but it was a great experience to really see how other clubs uh, were set up and how they ran their races and really to get to meet a lot of new people. Um, I'm sure everybody, you know, has all their Facebook friends and people that they know that are in Washington, but actually to be able to meet the people in person and hang out with them and get to know them. That was such a wonderful part of the whole experience. Um, and we brought home lots of ideas uh, from different clubs that we can use for our races too. You talked about dry land down there. Um, uh, tell us a bit uh, about the dry land in Alaska and how we are compared to the uh, lower 48. So um, we're, we're still pretty new up in Alaska. Um, and people are still acquiring the equipment, I think, is part of why we're so new. Not many people have the carts yet in comparison to the lower 48. So the biggest cart class we have up in Alaska is a four dog. Um, but I think our bike jerk classes are really robust up here and are as big as quite a few of the races um, that we went to in, um, in Wisconsin. So I, I think our bike jerk is coming along. Um, scooters coming along as more people are acquiring scooters and getting the equipment. Um, I think having an established track at Chugiak that can um, be used for races and is fast is wonderful. It's, it's not a technical track, but it's really a speed track. So it's kind of a different type of track than some of the other tracks that we raced on. Um, so I, I think it's definitely coming along and it's a new and a evolving sport up here and um i don't think we're that far behind where places are in the lower 48 so pam i have a couple of questions for you uh you kp and i have served together on the chugiak board and i know we talked about uh, uh you living in town with with dogs and you know kind of being in that urban environment but you've also been very active uh with sort of the politics of mushing in anchorage on the Animal Care and Control Board. We don't talk a lot about that on this show, but I would love to venture down that road a little bit with you. 
Can you tell us about that? Because when people think about mushing in Alaska, they have that romanticized version of mushing. You know, we're out there on these pristine trails and, you know, we're the last frontier and all that. But there's a heck of a lot of rules in our area, aren't there? Yeah. um, So just to clarify, it's the Animal Control Advisory Board. So we're actually not setting rules, but our uh, role is to propose things um, to the Anchorage Assembly, and a lot of the legislation that we propose is Title 17, um, kind of dealing with the care of animals um, in Anchorage municipality. So it's it's been a really good experience. Um, I've learned a lot about how politics work and how legislation works, and uh, that's been a steep learning curve. Um, the, the, the board of us, I believe it's approximately 10 of us, a very wide range of people, including a uh, lawyer for PETA on the board with me. Um, so we all bring in very different viewpoints, and it's uh, – it's, it's, it's been a good experience in, you know, trying to balance everything. And, um, I think we all have, you know, a love for animals, um, in the forefront of our mind, but what that looks like varies, um, for some of us. And so it, that's been a great challenge. So what, uh, what is a triumph and an ongoing struggle uh, with uh, sort of sled dogs in, you know, kind of in the new world, especially in Anchorage? You know, sled dogs in particular, um, well, just to give you an example, uh, there was a situation where somebody had dogs that they were living in a vehicle on a street. I guess the person had fallen on hard times and was staying with other people and her dogs couldn't be in there. So the the dogs were living in a vehicle on the street and it kind of caused a public outcry. So it came back to the Animal Control Advisory Board. Could we draft legislation to not allow dogs to live in a vehicle, you know, uh, permanently? Well, that actually, when you take something like that, that, you know, most of us would agree that, yeah, dogs living cooped up in a vehicle 24-7 is not a good situation. But then when you start looking at, well, if you try to create legislation, what are going to be all the unintended consequences of a new legislation that pulled in sled dogs? Say, for example, there's many teams that come down for for Rondi or Iditarod and the dogs will be living in a dog truck, which is made for it. And the dogs are very comfortable. That's that's they're used to it, and it's a very safe situation. Um, but in creating legislation that didn't allow dogs in a vehicle, you pulled those dogs in too. So we had to be careful to write it to allow other situations. You know, another example was the dog show um, crowd that they would come into town, and they would often have dogs in vehicles, or even just your basic pet owner coming up from, you know, uh, a remote area of Alaska that drives in with their dog to go to medical appointments. They're going to have a dog in a vehicle. And so then it became complicated of, well, how long can a dog be in a vehicle? What kind of a vehicle and what situation in a vehicle? And it, it, it's amazing how a simple topic becomes such a complex topic once you start dealing with trying to write legislation. Yeah, yeah, and, and and that's just one example, and there are so many with, with shelter and, you know, shade and all of that, and we could go on and on. But what we usually do on this show, Pam, is we ask our last question, and we typically, typically ask advice. But uh, since you're one of the first few guests that we've had on uh, after or still the ongoing pandemic – uh, we're asking, how do you think that this is going to change our sport this year coming up or in years uh, going forward? And, and I'm interested in your answer, in particular with travel. You had mentioned that you traveled south uh, uh, with, with a friend of yours and, and did the dryland circuit. So what do you think about this pandemic and, uh, you know, sort of the new normal with dog mushing coming up? That, that is a really great question, and actually I was just 
talking with quite a few of my friends that I communicate with on a regular basis that are in the lower 48 that I got to know quite well on the uh, dry land circuit. And it, it's, I, I, I wish I had all positive rosy things to say, but honestly, I'm kind of nervous um, on a few fronts. And uh, I was excited to go travel this year. Actually, I just bought a new van that we're going to be traveling with the dogs in but um i i worry a lot that I'll, many of the races that are community races that have lots of funding and sponsors and um a few key people that really work hard to put those races on and i don't know how their funding streams are going to be if the companies that have been sponsoring them and the community sponsors are falling on hard times right now. So I, I worry a lot about that. Um, uh, you know, whether, you know, I, I'm in the medical profession, I don't know if it's going to be uh, safe to travel, if we should be traveling. Um, I'm concerned if we do travel, you know, would we get in a situation where they start closing borders again, like quite a few of the people that got stuck in Alaska from I did Rod and Rondi when the borders closed. So I, I don't know. I don't know the direction this is going to take our sport in, but I do fear that it's really going to uh, take a hit for a few years at least. Um, one of my friends did make the point, though, that at least for in the situation they're looking at, uh, which is ski races that also do a ski jer race, which is a common thing in the lower 48, I'm not aware of anything in Alaska like that. But they think those will be fine as long as the skiing is still occurring because it's a very different community pool. Um, and the ski races are so big that it will keep those races going. But as far as the dedicated mushing races, um, I think it's going to be tough for a few years. It's interesting that you brought up the uh, the sponsorship side. And uh, for the guests that we've had on so far, you're the first to talk about that. And I agree with you. I think that that's going to be a big hit uh, for these smaller races when, you know, a lot of these businesses have been out of work for a couple of months now. And who knows what's going to happen in the future. It's going to be tough to knock on their doors and ask for, you know, a big sponsorship when, uh, you know, when they've they've had struggles of their own. So I think that that is definitely going to be a cause of concern as we move forward that's all i have for you pam uh kp anything else no i i agree with uh, pam and you for the sponsorship definitely uh part of the fundraisers that we have for the chugag dog mushers uh is the uh we uh create a poster with uh small businesses uh uh donating two three hundred dollars or 150 bucks uh to uh, support some of the races that we have. And I can see your point and Pam's point. Uh, these small businesses are people who got hit the hardest, of course. And uh, uh, myself asking uh, a lot of these businesses actually for donations, usually uh, I don't feel as comfortable as I did two years ago uh, for, uh, to ask people who own a restaurant, for example, who've been shut down for the last two months for, for money. Uh, Pam definitely mentioned that um well let's uh hope that this is going to end very very soon as we have a lot of training and a lot of races uh hopefully ahead of us pam i wanted to thank you for your time uh you spent with us uh i know you're busy with the uh, uh kids uh and being a teacher with uh all the uh classes and everything that you have to do with the kids um, and looking forward to see you on the trail um uh, training and racing as usual all right thank you so much this was fun Thank you. On behalf of our guest today, Pam Chamber, this is Robert and KP and I here for The Dog Driver. Make sure you check us out over on social media, searching for DogWorks Radio. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From First Paw Media, this is The Dog Driver Show. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you can see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. 
If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your hosts are Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Our producer is Robert Forto and created for First Paw Media. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forto and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.